Second verse, same as the first. These are six more great and not great examples of graphic design in games. Just as a reminder, while graphic design might seem like the same thing as art, it's really not. Graphic design is visual communication. It's things like menus, UI, camera work, color choice, font choice, animation, character design, the presentation of information. Good graphic design is a mix of usability and style that helps you know what you need to know. Bad graphic design is anything else. Style at odds with usability, usability without style, or if you're really unlucky, both. Making it harder to melt into a game. Good design. Splatoon is one of the most inventive shooters in years, and one of the major keys to its success is how well the designers at Nintendo thought through the game's use of color contrast. Splatoon relies on color contrast to guide players to the game's primary objective, paint the most terrain in your team's color. As the match plays out, your mini-map will update in real time, highlighting where your team is, where your opponents are fighting back, and what still needs to be covered. Splatoon uses a few tricks from color theory to make sure you can know all of that information with just a quick glance of the map. The key is in the color combinations of the ink. If you're designing a color scheme, there's one thing that you generally want to avoid. Color vibration. If there are two adjacent colors that are similar in brightness, the colors can vibrate and blur at the edges. This can be a common problem with true complementary color schemes, like blue-orange, red-green, and yellow-purple. Color vibration is intense, uncomfortable to look at, and even sometimes causing colorblind people to have trouble telling two hues apart. In Splatoon, the two paint colors will be next to each other all the time, just by the nature of the game. It's unavoidable, so how does Splatoon avoid color vibration? For the colors to have a strong contrast, the color combinations in Splatoon must be both different hues and values. Let's see what happens if I take away the game's saturation. You can still tell the difference between the two kinds of ink based on the difference in the color's value. Some combinations contrast more than others, but they all contrast enough to be effective. The highly contrasting colors makes it easy to see your team's progress and even helps eliminate some of the need for voice chat. Even the color palette of the unpainted map was designed carefully to work with the strong palette of the ink colors. The more washed out and neutral color palette of the terrain contrasts against the reflective and neon colored ink and makes it obvious what is and isn't painted. It's clear that a lot of thought went into the design of Splatoon's color palette, how it impacts the moment to moment gameplay, and how it fits into the world's style. Bad design. Behold, programmer menus. Yatsugarasu Attack on Cataclysm. It's got some nice character portraits, and it is functional. But these menus... Oh boy. Alright. Rapid fire graphic design problems. Ready go. Arcade Arcade. Key config should just be in the options. Grammar check your menus. This main menu has no composition. It's all just centered type with no framing or additional elements to support it. In the character select, all of this text is misaligned. All of this text is misaligned, and they tried adding spaces to cover it up. This chif. These gorgeous character portraits make the whole thing look like a bootleg copy of a different fighting game. Announcers are digitized photos that look like Mortal Kombat 1. Announcers' names overlap other pieces of text. What is this mystery smudge? Seven fonts. This speech bubble doesn't know when to stop. Boop. The TV ran out of toner. These hit sparks look stolen? K comma O. K comma O. What? This was released in 2015. Hire a graphic designer. Good design. You know, if you've seen any of my other videos, that I love me some kinetic typography. And Danganronpa, 
especially Danganronpa V3, has some of the most beautiful kinetic typography out there. In a nutshell, Danganronpa is a visual novel series, similar to Zeroscape and Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney. 16 hyper-talented high school students are forced to join a killing game, where the only way to escape is to get away with murder or die trying. It's high school anime Hunger Games, soaked in a marinade of gallows humor, outlandish mysteries, and surprisingly deep characterization. Danganronpa's presentation is striking, especially for a visual novel. The cardboard cutout character sprites and objects with deliberately incorrect perspective gives the game a distinct pop-up book style, but where the presentation truly shines is in the class trial segments. Here, the surviving students must debate who among them is the murderer, fail, and the murderer gets away while the innocent students are executed. This class trial concept presents a design challenge. How do you turn a group discussion into gameplay? Danganronpa's answer is what they call the non-stop debate. During these debates, characters will speak one after the other, providing their testimony and arguments for what happened, all of which is presented in kinetic typography. It's up to the player to see through the chaos of the debate and literally shoot through the weaknesses in your opponent's arguments with your own pieces of evidence or truth bullets in order to move the conversation forward. Think Phoenix Wright mixed with a light gun game like House of the Dead. This whole series has some great presentation, but V3 shows players this series' style at its absolute best. I love the opening of every non-stop debate. The camera spins around everyone as your truth bullets load up, perfectly setting the stage. From there, it jumps right into the discussion. Type comes in from all directions as characters make their statements. The type itself is simple, bold, and beautiful, and is loaded with personality through composition and animation. Words will intersect overlap, and fly across the screen with keywords being highlighted to help narrow down the number of options the player must consider. This was all present in the previous games, but V3 brings this idea further with different variations of the non-stop debate, including the even more chaotic panic debates where multiple arguments happen simultaneously, one-on-one -on -one debates where you refute your opponent by carefully cutting through their words, and the splitting scrum debate where you match the arguments of the opposing sides. The composition in the scrum debate where the cast faces off against each other in this profile shot just looks incredibly cool. Every version of the non-stop debate revolves around the same core challenge of just finding the heart of the problem, and the typography plays well into that. It's chaotic, but it's not overwhelming, and it matches thematically with the high stakes of the death game premise. Bad design. It can be easy to forget that Final Fantasy VI was created for 25-year-old hardware. In spite of the limitations of the SNES, FF6 was extremely atmospheric for its time. The stormy title card, the use of Mode 7 to create that somber opening of the Magitek armor trekking through the snowfield the charming goofy cutscenes that would play in the middle of boss fights, the opera scene. FF6 embraced its 16-bit limitations in ways that created its own personal style. Its sprite work is beautiful, and the graphic design, while not exactly a looker, did its job. Now enter the 2016 remaster. FF6 on PC is one of the worst looking remasters, period. They took a rough-looking interface and made it even uglier. The ATB bars are now bizarrely shown through the menu panning up from the bottom. Design decisions made to work with a mobile screen kill the experience on the PC, like these ginormous buttons that show less information on the screen than in the original. The overly clean and basic-looking typography has no personality or tone sticking out like a sore thumb against what's left of the game's 16-bit style. Even the localization got worse, the script got wordier without getting better. Even the title screen was butchered. Look at this. 
What's this gradient? Where's the drama? There's no animation. The logo just appears. The work put into the game makes it look cheaper, more like a ROM hack than a remastering, and it's really tragic. FF6 is an all-time classic that deserves a great remaster to introduce a new audience to this beautiful game. Good design. From the beginning, Little Big Plant has always been about the creativity of its players. Its secret strength is how it makes a large and complicated toolset easy to use with a console controller. And it does all this with its Poppet menu. The Poppet menu is your main creation tool, used for things like character customization, decoration, and of course, making levels. Little Big Planet has an extremely large amount of options to choose from. Hundreds of costume pieces, decorations, stickers, level geometry, logic tools, cinematic tools, materials, and so on. It could have been a huge pain to sort through all of your options, but the pop-up menus are energetic, well-organized, and easy to navigate with simple white animated iconography and clean typography. Objects are placed in a grid structure and are sorted by category and nothing feels out of place. Materials, decorations, stickers, costumes, and gameplay objects are all given their own section that you can flip through with the shoulder buttons. You can hide entire sections quickly and get your more commonly used items in one place, so finding and sorting what you need is super easy. All level creation, decoration, and editing is done with the Poppets cursor. Pick your object, resize, rotate, and move it to where you want, and then just place it down, and you can even undo or redo changes with one button press. Making the common things easy lets you pour more time into the creative side of level design, instead of wrestling with your options. The Poppet also has some really smart decisions built in for multiplayer. Each player can use their own Poppet menus without disrupting each other. The Poppet also shows you what other players are doing, which lets you work together more easily. Keeping track of your cursor is easy as the cursor itself has a string attached to your character, which lets you know who is building what. It's amazing how the developers of Little Big Planet have taken level creation, something that drags down dozens of games under the weight of its options, and makes it so seamless and easy without sacrificing the creative freedom of its players. Bad design. Here we go again, Mario Party A. Yeah, no, it's Battleborn. There is a lot to nitpick here, but let's zero in on this. Battleborn has a problem with focus and how it directs the attention of its players. Its UI elements are all very flashy, and there are a billion of them. Battleborn is a busy looking game to begin with. It has MOBA style characters with crazy special attacks and tons of particle effects. Having the UI scream for attention on top of all of that is just a bad choice. For this kind of multiplayer MOBA shooter hybrid, the player's attention needs to be on the action of the game, not the framing around it. Battleborn's contemporaries like Overwatch and League of Legends understand this. They have stylish UIs, but the events within the game are still the most important component of the visual design. In the UI for Battleborn, every element tries to grab your attention by being as bold, vibrant, and animated as possible. During big fights, your screen will be flooded in particle effects, auras, light boxes, damage numbers, flashing indicators, cooldown indicators, shield and health vignetting, player outlines, and status icons. Every time you get a kill, assist, or complete an objective, big or small, a fancy little animation will play in the upper left corner. All of these UI indicators pop off constantly, and they cover a big chunk of the screen every time they play. Battleborn's UI is so over the top that it starts to look like one of those fake games built for a TV show. Good design is often an exercise in restraint. Just because you can design an element in a flashy way doesn't always mean you should. If there's gonna be an animation for completing an objective, it needs to be fast and out of the way. Important icons shouldn't have to compete for your attention with less important ones. Each element must harmonize with the rest of the experience. Your UI should be a symphony, not a shouting match. Good graphic design is not easy to make, but understanding what goes into making it will let you appreciate their work just a little more.